the first of these ads, and they're not, I, they're, I, no, actually none of them is in English, but, you know. The Matterhorn is one of the key symbols of Switzerland, so it's analogous to Mount Rushmore, Statue of Liberty, uh, Washington Monument, White House, so on and so forth. This is from uh, an ad campaign in Switzerland to ban minarets. How many minarets are in Switzerland? Yeah, four in some estimates and seven in some other ones. I don't know how you get it, like, basically 100% wrong, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> maybe some dude was standing on a masjid, like, and then they, in the darkness, they thought he was a minaret, right? And then he, like, stepped down, and they went back, and they're like, oh, we don't know what it was. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know, right? Like, if I climb on top of a masjid in Switzerland, do I become a minaret? Am I illegal? Like, what do I do at that point, right? Um, is it only if I say something? Um, these are difficult questions to ask. Um, so this is a campaign to ban minarets, but notice that the most prominent part of the picture is not minarets. What's the most prominent part of the picture? Woman, right? Where is she in the picture? What's up? Front and center. Well, front. <laughs> See how she's being made to stand in front of the Matterhorn, and so is the mosque, saying what? Not just encroaching. Encroaching is like she's like tiptoeing up to it, right? Like this is like she's black. She's like standing between you and the Matterhorn. She's like, if you want to climb that mountain, you get through me. And she's really big and scary. She doesn't have any eyes, so she's like four hundred thousand feet tall. Because um, I don't know how big the Matterhorn is. If someone want to look it up on Google? I would appreciate that. You don't really have to do that. Um, same ad campaign. Another ad. Um, I did this workshop at UNC last week. Uh, and someone pointed out that these look like spears, and I actually never thought of it that way. I was, most of the people who, who frame this say they look like missiles. Uh, they're, they're on the Swiss flag, right? Um, but if you look at the minarets themselves, have you ever seen a minaret that pointy? Like, seriously, that looks like a dangerous minaret, right? Like, you know, I'm just saying, right? Like, you do not want to land on the, I don't know how you would land on the minaret, but just, you know, in case somehow, you know, sometimes these weird things happen, you have a bad day. Um, you don't want to land those minarets. There's more minarets in that picture than there are in Switzerland. Um, but nevertheless, it's enough of a danger that there's an ad campaign. What happened to this referendum? It passed. Yes, it passed. Uh, building minarets is illegal in Switzerland. Um, this one is not as objectionable, actually, in terms of blatant racism. Uh, Vlaams Belang is a right-wing uh, Belgian party, and all this ad is really saying is that you've got three parties, Christian Democrats, liberals, and socialists. Uh, there is an alternative to them, and it's sort of the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil kind of motif. The point being that there is a problem. What's the problem? Political correctness. Political correctness. Keep going with it. What else is the problem? Immigrants. Immigrants. Muslims. People who are not Belgian. Uh, and none of the mainstream parties will say that because they are afraid. Uh, this is the same theme that uh, a certain congressman who will go unnamed uh, used as a defense for his hearings. He said that the only reason people don't want to do this is because they're being politically correct. Uh, so it's the same motif, and this is where I want you to see that the language that's being used in Belgium is the language that's being used over here. And it's not merely a coincidence. Uh, there is an actual back and forth between it. This one is my favorite one for sheer retarded audacity, because um, it's just unbelievable. So this is basically saying that if we don't stop immigration, we are going to end up on a reservation. That's like, that's flipping and manipulating history in so many ways, it makes your head hurt if you think about it, right? Abdullah up here is just like, what is going on, right? This is like, that doesn't make any sense. You just want to be like, you need to take a history class. Um, this ad is saying that if Italians don't stop immigration, they're going to end up like Native Americans, meaning that they're going to end up in reservations in their own country. For those of you who have been following the immigration debate in the United States, one of the proposals that's come out of the Democratic Party, and occasionally some Republicans, is that we should reform the system but for everyone who's already here, who's illegal, we should just naturalize them because it's too much of a headache to figure out what to do with 10 or 11 million illegal aliens, right? Yes. Um, so her question is, how does this ad relate to Muslims uh, specifically, and, and where is immigration coming from? Uh, two things. One is the Northern League is an Italian secessionist party that advocates independence for Northern Italy. So the industrialized and wealthiest heartlands of Italy, which are basically in the north where most of the major companies are based, uh, they're advocating for separation because they even think that southern Italy isn't really European. Uh, so Naples, Sicily, Corsica, not Corsica, uh, Sardinia, uh, these places are not actually really Italian like we are. We should be separate. Uh, second point is, yeah, most of the immigration is from North Africa, 
There's also immigration coming from the east, from people who go from Albania to Italy, for example. Uh, and this is the point where race and religion get fused. It's not just that they're Muslim, it's also that they're ethnically other. And this is why the attack is partially, it is against a race or ethnicities that look different. It's also against a belief system. Uh, that's seen as so, so much of a threat to Italian society is going to do this. Uh, to go back to the point I made previously about naturalization, um, there was an ad campaign against a proposal in Switzerland to have uh, mass naturalization, which was basically to give amnesty to people who are already illegally in the country. And this is, um, there's two ads. This is the first one. Um, what are they reaching for? Passport, citizenship cards, ID cards, yeah, right? And who's reaching for them? Black, brown people, yeah. Um, and then this is the worst one, or the most blatant one. Um, now, I want you to think about that, right? Because this is an ad that appeared in public places in Switzerland. So if you're in a public place and you identify with the black sheep, right? where people are going to identify you with the black sheep, you're going to feel like you don't belong. Even if you are a citizen, even if you're legally there, you feel totally marginalized. Even if this doesn't represent the majority of people, the very fact that you're seeing it is deeply alienating. And, I mean, if you look at the sheep in the background, they're kind of like, they're, they're ambivalent. They're very confused about this, right? They're like, should he be doing it? But it's almost sort of like someone's got to do it, right? And you might be afraid to, but we're going to do it. And, you know, for more security, uh, kick them out or, you know, boot them out. Make sense? And I think this is, and, and this is a point that I want to really focus on. The most interesting thing about the kind of discourse around Islam and Muslims that we're seeing right now is that it inverts reality. Not just in the way of that weird Italian ad that inverts everything um, and has given several history teachers mild heart attacks. Uh, <laughs> The Muslim world is in no way a competitor to the West in any economic or political sense. It's a heck of a lot poorer. It's fragmented. It has no organizing bodies. It never acts with any unity of purpose or will, right? And yet, the way in which the narrative goes is that Islam, Muslims, immigrants, the other, are so deeply threatening that it goes beyond the narrative and the reality of terrorism, which is a reality, to an existential threat, right? Nazi Germany was an existential threat because it was sufficiently powerful that it took major world powers to take it down. And 400,000 plus Americans died in the process. Uh, radical Islam, while dangerous, is in no way an existential threat to Western civilization. It is unable to hold on to a single state it was based in a collapsed and failed state. It has no political vision. It is rejected by the majority of Muslims. And yet, it is imagined that it is part of some kind of threat that is so dangerous that it will overturn and conquer Western civilization. Hence, Sharia law is like some sort of secret fifth column that Muslims are using to take over the United States. For anyone who is Muslim, the fact that anybody thinks we can take over anything is both deeply appealing to our egos and the most ridiculous thing anyone has ever said, and that's the word of the day. Uh, for those of you who are at Juma, ridiculous was the word of the day. For those of you who are not at Juma, my khutbahs are weird. Um, that's all I can tell you. I want you to think about this. So I'll give you two, two statistics which are sort of indicative. Um, the market capitalization of Apple, like the computer there, or Google combined, is greater than the economy, the entire gross national product of Pakistan, which is the second most populous Muslim country in the world. Right? So two companies. Their market capitalization is bigger than Pakistan's entire economy. I'm not trying to hate on Pakistanis. My family's from Pakistan, but this is a reality, right? <laughs> and now the fact that people are labeling this a threat. Secondly, and let's focus on Pakistan, because Pakistan has the biggest military in the Muslim majority world. It is the only nuclear power in the Muslim majority world. Therefore, it is probably the most dangerous Muslim country if you look at it from that perspective. Its annual military budget is smaller than Harvard's endowment. That's the reality of how this plays out. And yet, somehow we've gotten into a situation in which Muslims are seen to represent a civilization so threatening and alien that it can undermine the United States. 
And this is the problem. Going from actual threats associated with terrorism, which also target Muslims, right, to this sense that all of Western civilization is about to go down. This is not a united discourse. There are a lot of different streams and fears that feed into it. And the way to respond to it, there's actually, I have about five or six ways to respond. But one of the key things to realize is that people are identifying different things about Islam that they find unsettling. So as long as we recognize that there is a real sense of anxiety around Muslims, a lot of it premised on terrorism and that reality, as well as the behavior of some Muslims in the Muslim-majority world, right? So what is done, for example, in the name of Sharia in many places in the Muslim-majority world, as long as we recognize that that's a reality uh, and that there is real anxiety, there are ways to push back. And one of the key ways to push back is to understand that it's not coming from the same source and it has different base foundations. So as an example, uh, the Islamophobic discourse that we see in the Netherlands, for example, is often powered by what I would call like the hard left. Uh, so Kurt Wilders, for example, is in favor of gay marriage and a very liberal individual. Uh, he's also very much against Muslim immigration in the Netherlands. And although he works with people on the right in the United States, the people he works with have a very different idea of what it means to be a Westerner. Right? There's a much more secular conception in, for example, the late Jörg Haider's Freedom Party, whereas some of the conceptions that you see in the United States are much more rooted in a religious identity. So there are some serious differences here, which also suggest that this is not some sort of eternal problem that is simply going to just step on top of you, but that it's a discourse that has come together for different reasons. Um, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, that comes together for different reasons, and that itself can be pushed back against, or debated with, or engaged, or even displaced with a variety of different strategies. So yeah, you had a question back. So the, the question was the, the relationship between globalization and the fear of Muslims, and whether it's the, the fear of Muslims is used as a way to justify pushing a certain economic agenda. Um, I would say two things, which I think are really interesting. One is, uh, if you remember over the whole Park 51 thing, Newt Gingrich said that we won't uh, allow them to build a mosque near Ground Zero until we can build a, a church in Saudi Arabia, therefore saying the essence of America was a Christian church, which I'm sure a lot of people appreciated. Uh, but for any of you who have been to Mecca, like after the actual Grand Mosque in Mecca, what is the most prominent thing? Where do you eat? The mall. What's in the mall? Exactly, right? I mean, if you're going to talk about Mecca and like Americanness in Mecca, like America is like all over Mecca, right? <laughs> if you go, you go eat at KFC, you eat at McDonald's. I mean, the reality, and this is what I was talking about, the, the fact that it's assumed that the, somehow the Muslim world is immune from America's economic power is part of this narrative that people don't understand. Uh, there are very few Saudi institutions at all in the United States or any Saudi cultural influence in the United States on anywhere near the order of uh, Western cultural influence across the Muslim world. Hence, you had people all over Egypt holding up signs that said, yes, we can. Um, you know, this kind of traffic, for a lot of different reasons, generally goes in one way due to economic power. Uh, the second point is I actually think that a lot of the people who are afraid of Muslims are unsettled because of globalization because they themselves are losing because of it. So a lot of people in the United States um, have seen their income stagnate and their economic position and clout frozen. So the fact that you can feel like, that a white American can feel like their country is being taken away from them is not an abstract scenario. It comes out of a real feeling that you are not moving anywhere economically or socially, and apparently people who are very different from you seem to be doing well. Uh, so all the anxiety around China, you know, there are real economic anxieties, I think, at work here, which power cultural anxieties in the sense that I don't have a role in my country anymore. It's not my country anymore. And so I do think that there is globalization there, but I think paradoxically it goes in both directions. Um, but I, I do think that in the Muslim world, too, it's a big fear of the sense of being economically uh, colonized or recolonized or continue to be colonizing. I mean, however you want to look at it. Um, so thank you very much. That was part one and two. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, and, and inshallah, after, uh, after we pray, we'll have part three.